So we're now going to look at Cardinal Peter Erdo from Hungary. We're going to spend a little bit more time looking at the life of this man. He is definitely one of the strongest contenders for, to be the next Pope, along with um, Cardinal Tagle. I would push Cardinal Tagle and Cardinal Peter Erdo uh, as the two front runners in the next conclave. Cardinal Erdo, he's an intellectual. He is well known in the church. He speaks fluent Italian, uh, canon law, professor. Um, I mean, he ticks all the boxes as regards leadership in the church. Very, very strong man. If people have noticed, there's a picture, the flame of the divine love here behind me. And uh, he has pushed. He's a, he's a Marian cardinal. So it's very, very interesting, the profile of Cardinal uh, Peter Erdo of Hungary. So I think it's very, very important that people study his life, his works, his thought. Um, and, you know, possibly he could be the next pope. He is 70. So he's w he's within that age bracket that you would expect a pope to be elected. And um, we'll see. We'll see what's what will be the outcome in the next conclave. Uh, he's he would definitely be um, somebody who would be able to lead the church. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I think he's been well prepared. He's he's I mean, he spans his his life is is very is, is quite amazing in, in much in many in many ways. And uh, I do think people should should listen to him. So I'm going to go through his, a little bit of his bio. I'm going to play one of his homilies so that people can hear, listen to him, hear him, understand him um get get familiar with him and uh, who knows we'll see in the, we'll see after the next conclave um what, who will be the next pope but i think it's important that people familiar become familiar with cardinal peter erdo there's also a prophecy that the next pope will be a peter so that's why as well focusing on that aspect i know pro i know people might say oh that's uh, that's neither here nor there but there, it is prophesied that the, the next Pope <laughs> will be a Peter. Who knows? But uh, uh, certainly we cannot rule out Cardinal Peter Erdo. He is uh, he's not he's 70. He is well prepared and well liked in Rome among cardinals. Um, and let's see. Anyway, let me just play this for you. God bless you. Take care. Bye bye. So we're going to go through the bio of Cardinal Peter Erdo. Erdo from Hungary and we're going to start obviously with the Vatican uh, his Vatican bio Cardinal Peter Erdo Metropolitan Archbishop of Estergom Budapest and Primate of Hungary was born in Budapest in on the 25th of June 1952 the first of six children in a family of Catholic intellectuals he was ordained a priest on the 18th of June 1975 in Budapest between 1975 and 1977, he served in the parish in the city of Dorog. He obtained a doctorate in theology in 1976. Between 1977 and 1980, he studied at the Pontifical Lateran University Institutum Utrius Iuris in Rome, at the end of which he obtained a doctorate in canon law in 1980. Between 1980 and 1986, he was professor of theology in Erstegom, and from 1986 to 1988, he was lecturer, and and from 1988 to 2002, visiting visiting professor at the Pontifical Gregorian University. From 1988 to 2002, he was professor of canon law, and from 1988 to 2003, rector of the Peter Pashmani Catholic University. From 1996 to 2003, he was also Dean of the Postgraduate Canon Law Institute. During his rectorship, the Peter Pastami University gained pontifical status and opened a new faculty of information theology. On the 5th of November 1999, he was nominated by Pope John Paul II, titular Bishop of Pupi and Auxiliar of uh, Keresh Fair Lavar, receiving Episcopal ordination on the 6th of January 2000. On 
the 7th of December 2012, Pope John Paul II transferred him. That's actually a mistake on the back show on the website. It must have been 2002, not 2012, because John Paul II was dead in 2005. So the Vatican better correct this. Anyway, I'll, I'll, uh, on the 7th of December 2002, I presume, Pope John Paul II transferred him to the Metropolitan See of Erstegom, Budapest, appointing him Archbishop of Erstegom, Budapest and Primate of Hungary. He was created Cardinal on the 21st of October 2003. In 2005, he was elected president of the Hungarian Bishops' Conference and was re-elected in 2010 for another five-year mandate until 2015. In 2006, he was elected president of the Council of Bishops' Conferences of Europe, CCEE, and re-elected in 2011 until, and was in charge until October 7, 2016. He participated in the city missions in the great European cities, Vienna, Paris, London, Lisbon, Brussels and Budapest. He was one of the initiators and one of the co-presidents of the Catholic Orthodox European Forum. Since 2003, he has participated in all assemblies of the Synod of Bishops, including those devoted to Africa, 2009, and Middle East, 2010. General Relator in the Third Extraordinary General Assembly of Bishops, a Synod of Bishops, uh, October 2014, on the topic, the pastoral challenges of the family in the context of evangelization. General Later in the 14th Extraordinary General Assembly on the topic of the vocation and mission of the family in the church in the contemporary world, October 2015. His prodigious systematic reading has led to the publication of more than 250 articles and 25 books in the field of canon law and medieval history of canon law. He has also published a number of cultural and spiritual works. He has received a number of awards and honours, an honorary doctorate from the Institut Catholique de Paris of 1996, from the, Be- the Beloy Boloi University in Cluy uh, Napoitza in 2001, from the Catholic University of Lublin in 2004, from the University of Munich in 2007, Constanza 2008, from the Stepan Wyszynski University in Warsaw 2011, and from the University of Navarra 2011. He has also received the Galileo Galilei Prize, Pisa 1999. He participated in the Conclave April 2005, which elected Pope Benedict, and the Conclave of March 2013, which elected Pope Francis. Created and proclaimed Cardinal by Saint John Paul II in the consistory of the 21st of October 2003 of the title of Saint Balbina. He is a member of the Secretariat of State, Council of the Economy, Dicasteries of Oriental Churches, Divine Worship and Discipline of the Sacraments and the Supreme Tribunal of the Apostolic Signatura. So there's his the long bio of Cardinal Peter, Peter Erdo and it's important to note he he's a frequent visitor to Rome. If we look at his Wikipedia page, we see much of what was already mentioned on the on his Vatican page, and uh, it's it's very. He's he, I do recommend that people go and read the bio of Peter Erdo. He is definitely one of the candidates for the next election. Um, you know, it's interesting to remember that he grew up under communism. You know, this is the man that grew up, you know, we, if people don't remember Cardinal Mishinsky, Mishin, M- Mincenti, sorry, Cardinal Mincenti. You know, he's he's the successor of Cardinal, in a sense. Um, and, uh, you know, he's he is a conservative, conservative cardinal. And there's no, there's no, there's no uh, doubt about that. And he comes from one of the uh, conservative Catholic countries in Europe. So I recommend people, please read, uh, read up on Cardinal Peter Erdo. And we'll just, I just look here. Uh, he is um, 70. He was born on the 25th of June, 1952. So he is 70. So definitely one that's uh, uh, papabile as they say 
Uh, I'm just going to play you a homily that he gave a few years at a Eucharistic conference, just so that you get a, an understanding of, of, of him. And, uh, and please pray for him. And uh, please pray that he, that Peter brings the Immaculate Heart of Mary to Rome. God bless you. Take care. Bye bye. Eminences, Excellencies, dear brothers in priesthood, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a great joy for me to celebrate together with you the great thing of the love of Jesus Christ, the Eucharist. We arrived from Budapest with a Hungarian delegation from a country where the majority of the people are Christian. But there is also a great secularism and individualism, where a number of people live only for the comfort of the moment, from a country which is not very poor, but not too rich, from a country where hopelessness and depression are greatest temptations. In 2007, we held a mission in the city of Budapest. The motto came from the prophet Jeremiah to give you a future and a hope. I see with the utmost joy that here in the Philippines there are a lot of young people that they participate in immense numbers in celebrating the Eucharist. Christians, the disciples of Christ, make one community all over the world. The hope and joy of our brethren is a great encouragement for us. In our world, noise, dispersion, and the rapidness of our lives is what kills hope in us. If we think that the greatest goal of our lives is just to feel good in the present moment, then we think neither of God, nor of our fellow creatures, nor of our future. We don't feel responsibility for the others, for our family, our nation, and all humankind. Then we will fall into the trap of individualism, as Pope Francis said in his famous speech in Strasbourg. But then we will see our future with fear. We will be afraid that we will feel worse in the future. We will feel illness and death, which will come to all of us. We will be similar to the Gentiles of whom the Apostle Paul says. But we would not have you, have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have gone to their, death, their rest, that you may not grieve as others who don't have hope. Early Jewish thought includes the idea that one can help the deceased in their intermediate state through prayer. The equivalent practice was readily adopted by Christians and is common to Eastern and Western Church. The souls of the departed can receive solace and refreshment through the Eucharist, prayer and almsgiving. The belief that love can reach into the afterlife, that reciprocal giving and receiving is possible, in which our affection for one another continues beyond the limits of death, this has been a fundamental conviction of Christianity throughout the ages and remain, it remains a source of comfort today. Who would not feel the need to convey to their departed loved ones a sign of kindness, a gesture of gratitude, or even a request for pardon? It is Christ who creates a community among the people. With his birth, he made humankind one family. And it is he who, through his death and resurrection, gave us eternal life and happiness. In the most ancient Eucharistic prayers, 
the emphasis is on giving thanks. In the Holy Mass, we say today, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We give thanks because he became man, he was born, he suffered and died to liberate us from suffering and death. The Church, with this thanksgiving, introduces us to the Word of Christ during the Last Supper. This is my body, this is my blood. Celebrating the Holy Mass is also the adoration and reception of the body and blood of Christ. This expresses our thanksgiving and joins us to the sacrifice of Christ and his glorified life. This gives a perspective, goal and hope to our lives. This is the source of our joy. The motto of the Congress of the Congress are the words of the Apostle Paul from his letter to the Colossians. Christ in you is the hope of glory. What is this glory? And what does it mean that Christ is in us? Is he among us? Is he in our community? Or is he inside us, in our hearts? The Apostle Paul asserts many times that if Christ is in us, our bodies are dead to our sins, and our spirits are alive because of our righteousness. In this sense, the glory is eternal life. If Christ lives inside us, already on this earth, then he will not abandon us even in death but will give us life and a share in God's life and wealth. That is his glory. But here, in the letter to the Colossians, the stress seems to be on the community. The letter to Colossians says, just before this, this sentence, that he went to reveal God's mystery even to the Gentiles. In this sense, the Christ who appears among men through us Christians is the hope of eternal joy for every man. When Christ said to his disciples, you are the salt of the earth, he seemingly speaks about the same mission. The vocation of Christians is to give a good taste to the world, that is to show that the life of man is not an aimless drifting along, but it has a goal, a meaning. The whole history of mankind is in the perspective of the love of God. But since we are the salt of the earth, we have to protect the world from decaying. We have to be those righteousness for righteousness ones for whose sake, in view of the merits of Christ, God will show mercy to the world. So Christ among us is the hope of glory, not only for us, but for all humankind. Christ is the hope of glory. Jesus of Nazareth was a real historical person. In him, the disciples recognized the Christ, the Messiah, the Liberator sent by God. Christianity is not simply philosophical, but it is connected to the historical person of Jesus Christ. We are his disciples. If we accept him in faith as our Messiah, as our Savior, that is, as the Christ, this is what gives hope to mankind. For the man of today to contact Christ, we must propagate, propagate him openly. We must speak about him. We have to say his name and we have to confess our faith. I come from a country which was under communism for a long time. There were family men who had to decide between their faith and their jobs. If they confessed their faith, they lost their jobs. 
and sometimes they also ended up in prison. And these men were often puzzled to see that some people, for the comfort of the family, would abandon and renounce their faith. And it often happened that, and this remains in the memory of many families, the puzzled man was asked by his family and his wife to remain faithful to Christ, even if they might lose their livelihood, they would be able to look at their father with respect, knowing that there is a merit which is much greater than life on earth. They might go in need, but they will not lose hope and trust in Almighty God and in eternal life. Dear brothers and sisters, this is the hope which is needed today. The world needs Christ. The world needs us if we belong to Christ. Amen.